So I'm very honored to be here tonight and yesterday. This is not just my first time at the Montreal Winter School. Not just my first time in Canada. It's my first time in North America. And I can't think of a better way to be introduced to North America than the biggest Marxist event in North America. Yeah, the bourgeoisie of Canada and the US, they have no idea what potential we have in this room and in the entire event. The states have no idea what's coming. Now, the question of the state is a key question for Marxists. It's sort of like a test that separates real revolutionaries and those who mean business from those who don't. And Lenin, he pointed this out in State and Revolution that only those who recognize the dictatorship of the proletariat are real Marxists. He says, it is often said and written that the main point in Marxist theory is the class struggle. But this is wrong. And this wrong notion very often results in an opportunist distortion of Marxism. And its falsification in a spirit acceptable to the bourgeoisie. That is, if you limit yourself to struggle within the confines of capitalism, if you do not advocate a socialist revolution where the working class takes power, from the bourgeoisie and smashes the bourgeois state, replaces that with a worker state, that is, the dictatorship of the proletariat, that's what it means, then I would say, you're not just a real Marxist, you're not a consistent revolutionary. That's why we are Marxists. We know that that is the only way to be a consistent revolutionary. That means even anarchists who also advocate smashing the bourgeois state, they understand that this is needed. But they don't advocate setting up a worker state. This means that they're also not consistent revolutionaries in the end. And we've seen this in revolutions when the anarchists have been tested. That is mainly the Spanish revolution in the 30s. because they're against the dictatorship of the proletariat, against any form of state, it means in practice they are against the working class taking power. That 
And I will return to this, this uh, later on. But you cannot be a revolutionary. You cannot ignore the question of the state if you want to be a revolutionary. Or have an unclear understanding of it. You can try, but that will reveal itself sooner or later on. That actually you don't understand what a socialist revolution is. And what's necessary to take power from the capitalists. Now for reformists, those reformists who actually envision a different socialist society. That is, the ones who don't merely see the goal being a capitalism with a human face. For them, the task is not to, to smash the bourgeois state. For them, the, the state is neutral. What party is in government is basically what decides the character of the state. For them, the bourgeois state is the tool, the mechanism in which you can make the transition from capitalism to socialism. You win an election and perhaps you propose a referendum, yes or no to socialism. And then you carry it out peacefully. The bourgeoisie will not object, they imagine. The bourgeoisie, they're reasonable people. Respectable. They will admit they've been uh, defeated democratically. This is how the German Marxist, later turned reformist, Karl Kautsky put it. He said that if the capitalists found themselves in an insignificant minority, under universal suffrage, they would more readily become reconciled with their fate. Now, they are, of course, an insignificant minority. And they have many times seen left parties winning elections. But they have certainly not reconciled with their fate. Whenever they found themselves having a government that actually poses a real threat to capitalism. Now, in reality, the state is not neutral. It does its best to appear as such to stand above society, act as a kind of mediator between the classes, especially in countries like uh, Sweden. Yet in every class society, it is the tool to defend the ruling class. The, the tool of the ruling class to defend their order. And Lenin explains this in a lecture that he gave in 1919. He says that the state is a ma machine for maintaining 
the rule of one class over another. He says it's always been a certain apparatus which stood outside of society and consisted of a group of people engaged solely or almost solely in ruling. People are divided into the ruled and into the specialists in ruling. Now this is generally presented as, as necessary. Unless you surrender the tasks of running society to so-called experts, standing above society, I mean, you could question today if, if the politicians are really experts. But this is what they argue, that unless you have that, and unless you have a separate organ for violence, that maintains law and order, then you would have absolute chaos. But this is only necessary in a society split into opposing classes. For the majority of human history, the state did not exist. During the hunter and gatherer societies, there were egalitarian societies. Without private property, without oppression, without a state. The period that was called primitive communism by, by Marx and Engels. And these societies did not have unelected leaders standing above society. Dictating, dominating, oppressing the rest of society. There was no separate army that could subjugate a powerless majority. Instead, you had an armed population. The state arises with class society, with private property. as a tool to protect that private property of the emerging ruling class. And instead of the armed population, you start to see what, what Marx and Engels and Lenin refer to. As the armed bodies of men a separate body for violence. Now, now, the state has taken on many different forms throughout history. And it, it can take on many different forms under capitalism. But it's always been shaped by uh, the needs of the ruling class and a tool of the ruling class. And under capitalism, whether you have a military uh, dictatorship, fascism, democracy, republic or monarchy, the state always remains a bourgeois state, which task it is to uphold and defend capitalism. Now, this doesn't mean that the capitalists hold some sort of absolute control over the state. Donc, 
Capitalism is an anarchic system. The capitalists compete with each other over market shares. Different wings of the bourgeoisie have different interests. They don't always necessarily share the same opinions of what's needed by a government. But they do have certain shared interests. And they have a lot of different means to make sure those are looked after by the state. All the vast resources held by the capitalists used to finance certain parties. Lobby politicians in regard to specific policies. Means ordinary people do not have. And just the fact that politicians and department officials have privileges and wages more similar to the bourgeoisie. It means they naturally share a way of life, an, an outlook, an interest with the capitalists rather than the workers. And when policies are considered that run counter to the interests of the big bourgeoisie, they'll use those resources to try and put a stop to it. And sometimes all they need is a little prodding. Like when the Swedish government in 2008 considered abandoning building a weapons factory in Saudi Arabia. Then they got a little letter from the biggest capitalist family in Sweden called Wallenberg, that owns the largest weapons manufacturer in Sweden, Saab. And quickly they changed their mind. The same thing happened in 2021. The Social Democratic Minister for Infrastructure got a text from Jakob Wallenberg. Saying that SAS, the Swedish Airlines, was in de desperate need of cash. And four days later, the government delivered. Now imagine if it was that easy for a teacher fighting cuts in a school. All you need to do is send a little text and then boom, the money is in the mailbox or invoice. Now we know that's not the case. Now, sometimes they need a little bit more drastic measures. When a government poses a real threat to capitalism, like Allende's government in Chile in the 70s, that is, if they lose control over parts of the state, over the government, They can use their wealth, their resources, their control over other parts of the state to force that government to comply. To undermine it, or if needed, organize a coup d'etat. Uh, 
Now, unlike the general belief in large parts of the world, the Swedish state, the Scandinavian states, are not cases of when the bourgeoisie lost control over the state. when the state suddenly became neutral or perhaps even a tool of the working class. In Sweden, the social de democracy held power uninterruptedly between 1936 and 1976. And they carried out many reforms. It was a period of great improvements for the working class. But the thing is, none of those reforms posed a threat to the bourgeoisie. And rather than this image of there being some sort of something special about Scandinavia. Scandinavia just follows the same line of development as the rest of the advanced capitalist countries. Because in the post-war period, in all Western countries, we saw increased living standards, higher wages, reforms. On the one part, it was a way to stave off the threat of communism. But it was also because there, this was a period of, of a massive boom. A massive development of the productive forces. These reforms, these higher wages, did not threaten the profits of the capitalists. The reforms carried out in Sweden during the post-war period were not the result of the workers wrestling those concessions from the bourgeoisie. There was not a lot of class struggle during this period. nor the state having to be in constant battle with the bourgeoisie. Now, because of the boom, they simply didn't pose a threat to the capitalists. Now, this ended with a crisis in the 70s. Scandinavia, Sweden, again follows along the same patterns as the rest of the advanced world, the advanced capitalist countries. The capitalists demanded cuts, uh, lower wage increases, casualization of the labor force. And the reformist labor movement abided. The long period that the social demo democracy was in power, what it mainly meant was that the state and the labor movement merged. To a much higher degree than in other countries. In all countries, the bourgeoisie, especially in the advanced countries, rest on the labor movement. They rest on them for support, to hold back the working class. But this is especially the case in Scandinavia. It's the main source of stability for capitalism there. 
And this has meant that the reformist degeneration and, and, and the corruption of the labor movement has gone to, to an extreme. And it has cemented very strong ties between the tops of the labor movement and the capitalists. Where many social democratic ministers and trade union officials have been rewarded for their services in attacking the working class. with very nice jobs in, in big business. In, for example, in Joran Passion's social democratic government that ruled from 95 to 2006, a government that really slaughtered the welfare Thirteen out of forty-four ministers got uh, positions in big business afterwards. Joran Passion himself, the prime minister, he went on to work for a bank, lead that bank, became the, the how do you say, board chair. as well as for the biggest uh, mining company. And all the bourgeois press have saluted him for what a great job he's done. Another social democratic politician, Ilya Batlan, uh, yeah, Ilya Batlan is his name. Um, he uh, worked with infrastructure as a, as a politician. Um, and housing, those questions. And, and after he quit being a politician, he, he formed a um, real estate company that bought up um, facilities from local councils all across Sweden. He targeted the local councils that were heavily indebted and, and needed to do a lot of cuts. And he bought up schools and elder care homes. and then rented it back to the councils for a lot of money. And that way they became even more indebted and he made tons of money. Now his, his, this company is on the verge of bankruptcy. So at least there's, there's some form of, form of justice. But there's tons of examples like these. And the thing is, not just all the, the reforms that we've seen um, that have increased living standards and so on. Uh, not just in Sweden, but all over the world. Or in the advanced countries. Advanced. Uh, but also the formal rights that, that we have won that gives the working class um, freedom of press and so on. Enables the working class to hold the same kind of power over the state or the media or whatever.
that the bourgeoisie holds. Democracy under capitalism is, it's a democracy for the bourgeoisie. It's a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. There's no such thing as a pure democracy. Devoid of class content. And Lenin explains this in the proletarian revolution and the renegade Kautsky. He says, it's natural for a liberal to speak of democracy in general. But a Marxist will never forget to, answer, uh, to ask, for what class? Everyone knows, for instance, that rebellions or even strong ferment among the slaves in ancient times at once revealed the fact that the ancient state was essentially a dictatorship of the slave owners. And Lenin asks, did this dictatorship abolish democracy among and for the slave owners? And he answers, everybody knows it did not. Now this is what we mean when we say we struggle for the dictatorship of the proletariat. Because in this sense, dictatorship and democracy are not opposites, but synonyms. It describes which class holds power. Bourgeois democracy is the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Workers' democracy is the dictatorship of the proletariat. It simply means rule based directly upon force and unrestricted by any laws. The dictatorship of the proletariat means the working class taking power in a socialist revolution. With their own state and using that state to suppress the capitalists from retaking power. Now, this was precisely the conclusion that Marx and Engels drew after the Paris Commune in 1871. That the workers couldn't use the bourgeois state, the old state, they had to smash that and build their own state. And the Paris Commune had shown what type of state uh, that needed to be. And the difference between the Paris Commune and the bourgeois state, it was that it was placed in the hands of the masses. They replaced the standing army with the armed people. All officials were elected and subject to recall. Not just the politicians, but all officials. The entire, normally, the, the mo most of the state is completely officials that are completely unelected. And these officials were, were elected, they came from the working class themselves. They no longer had the privileges, the wages uh, of, of the old, uh, privileged old representatives. But a working man's wage. 
It was, as Marx said, a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. They made the decisions and carried them through. And through these measures, the state became a, transformed from a tool of the minority against the majority. From an instrument built to corrupt the officials of the state and place them under the influence of the bourgeoisie. To an instrument controlled by the workers themselves. with principles aimed at counteracting corruption. Now, Engels referred to the worker state as a half state. He explained that when the task no longer is to oppress the majority, but suppress the minority, it starts to lose its character of a bo body standing above society, <inaudible> ruling over the people. <inaudible> this kind of state is built precisely to, to dissolve itself or, or wither away. The larger the parts of the population that become part of the state, that get elected as, uh, as officials, the more those bodies of, of workers' power are branched out from city level down to, to um, uh, workplaces. up to regional, national, and international levels, the more it engulfs every level of society, the more the positions are rotated, the less of a state it is. The more it fuses with society at large, the more it withers away. But this is only part of, uh, as part of a socialist revolution, where the workers uh, seize control of the economy as well. But the opposite is also true. That is, only with a worker state can you proceed towards socialism and even more communism. State ownership over the economy is not enough. And Ted Grant, our founder, uh, the founder of this international, he explained this. He said that there's no automatism over of the productive forces without the control of the workers of the state. Without conscious control on the part of the proletariat, whose dictatorship is intended to speedily dissolve all elements of state coercion into society, the state, as evidenced in Russia and China, inevitably gains an impetus and a movement of its own. And this is what we saw, the isolation of the revolution in the Soviet Union, in a backward country. Which laid the foundation for the rise of the bureaucracy. Could not lead to socialism or even less communism. 
without the working class regaining the power over the state. And this also means that a worker state has to emerge during a revolution. Marx and Engels, they already explained this in the Communist Manifesto. The emancipation of the workers must be an act of the workers themselves. You cannot give power to the working class. If the working class does not lead the revolution and starts building up the embryo of the worker state during that revolution, then the state will not be a proper worker state. And we saw this in the Chinese Revolution in 1949, where the task of the proletariat was carried out by Mao's uh, peasant army. And consequently, the state was built up in the image of Mao's army. But in all revolutions where the working class has played that leading role, and, and even in the ones where, where that hasn't been the case, you, you've seen tendency towards this, you have seen these, these bodies of workers' power emerging. Workers' councils, factory committees, Sometimes very embryonic, sometimes more developed. The first example being the Paris Commune. The second, perhaps the most classic, the Soviets in the first Russian Revolution of 1905. And none of these examples of workers' cou uh, councils uh, or embryonic ones are, are the products of Marxist theoreticians. Revolutionaries setting out from an idea of how uh, a worker state ought to be built up and then instructing the workers to do it. Paris Commune was certainly not a product of Marx and Engels, nor the Soviets a product of the Bolsheviks, as we, we heard yesterday. They were quite suspicious of them. They are simply how the workers naturally tend to organize themselves during a revolution. And they can take on many different forms, strike committing committees all coordinating strikes in a city, malicious counsel to defend the workers against police violence or violence from fascists, factory committees taking over the running of a factory. They can quickly develop from organs created for the class struggle. Into organs of power. And this is especially uh, the case during a revolution when, when society tends to break down. When there's a lot of strikes and protests going on. Yet workers still need food, transport, everything. They realize that their need for their own press, their own meeting places. So they simply start to organizing these things themselves. In Russia in 1905, the Soviets, Council in Russian, they appeared as, as these coordinating strike committees, coordinating strike movements in, in cities. The 
The first one was in a textile city, a quite short-lived one. But the most developed, the strongest one, was in St. Petersburg, which Trotsky became the leader of. And in Petersburg, the factories and workshops all over the city elected one deputy, one representative, for every 500 workers. And these representatives, these deputies, became the Soviet. And that became an organ of power very quickly. It introduced an eight-hour working day. And the bosses didn't have any option. The workers decided to work for eight hours. It realized the freedom of press simply by confiscating print shops and houses to have meetings in. That is, they uh, also realized freedom of assembly. They organized support for the unemployed. They organized armed militias in the factories. They confiscated weapons to guard their print shops. It was the real organ of power in the city when it existed. It was looked upon a government and it acted as a government. even by the, the class enemies. This can be seen in the words written uh, in uh, Navaya Vremya, uh, the paper of the Tsarist bureaucracy uh, and the uh, landowners. They wrote that in Petersburg we now have two governments. One with great authority but without influence. That is Vite's government. The other with no authority, but that everyone abides. The Soviet of the workers' deputies. Now this is what we call dual power. The official state on paper still exists. But besides it, the beginnings of a worker state has emerged. That in reality is calling all the shots. And this is a situation that cannot last forever. One side must win. And, and sweep away the other. Either you centralize all the Soviets, elect a government and sweep away the old state, take power from the capitalists, or the old uh, ruling class will, will, and the old state will sweep away the organs of, of uh, workers' power. In 1905, the Tsarist regime won out and smashed the revolution violently. But in 1917, the Soviets won. Now, the lie being told of the, the October Revolution that it was just a coup carried out by the Bolsheviks, where Lenin became the dicta dictator like he'd always dreamed about. Is, I mean, even some bourgeois historians have to admit the truth when they really tell the story of the Russian Revolution. Uh, 
That is that power was already in the hands of the working class from the beginning of the revolution through the Soviets. And they were already centralized with the first all-Russian Soviet Congress in the summer of 1917. The problem was the reformist leadership. So when the Bolsheviks won the majority of the Soviets, then they could organize the uprising, arrest the provisional government, and just a little story. In the Winter's Palace, there is a room with a sign uh, and a clock next to it. And on the sign it says, in this room in 1917, at the time uh, where the clock has stopped, the provisional government was arrested. And as we heard yesterday, as we heard yesterday, the uprising was very smoothly organized. Because of, of the power of, of the Soviets, on the one hand, and because of the strength of the leadership, the clarity of the leadership of the Bolsheviks and Lenin above all. And this uprising took place at, at the same time as the second All-Russian Soviet Congress. That elected the, the uh, people's commissars, the, the Soviet government. Now this was the most advanced example that we've seen. where they also actually took power. But variants of the same thing appear in revolution after revolution, in time and time and time again. Workers and soldiers councils in the German revolution in 1918. Workers' councils in the Spanish Revolution in the 30s. Factories taken over by the workers and land by the peasants. Jump forward to the Shuras, the councils in the Iranian Revolution in 1979. The committees in the first intifada in Palestine in 1987. The occupied factories movement in Latin America and above all Venezuela in the beginning of this century. And that's just a handful of, of examples. In, in Sudan in 2019, We didn't see a workers' council. But what we did see, it was not very advanced, but we saw the people on the streets. Occupying the main square. And again, they just start to organize everything by themselves. And a journalist described it as a mini-state within the state. What we see is a reoccurring theme of the future society being born from within the old society. And I would say this is the main argument we should use. 
It disproves the idea that socialism doesn't work. That communism is a nice idea in theory, but it will never work in practice. You know, sometimes I think we, we tend to say, oh, it, but actually it's never been tried on a global scale and so on. It's true, we haven't seen real socialism, real communism. But we can say it works. All the main components that lead towards socialism has proven itself time and time again. Workers have proven that they can run society time and time again. And the planned economy, despite being distorted and held by, back by the bureaucracy in, in the Soviet Union, in China and so on, proved its superiority to the market economy time and time again. Trotsky explained this. He said socialism demonstrated its right to victory, not on the pages of Das Kapital, not in the language of dialectics, but in the language of steel, cement, and electricity. That is, we cannot just say, well, our theories are very good and they can predict the future and so on. No, no, no. We have practical evidence that it will work. Now, I said in the beginning that Anarchists are not consistent revolutionaries. And I refer to the Spanish Revolution. Because that's, that's the main thing you can refer to. Most of the time, the anarchists have not become a mass force. have not really been tested in that way. You know, they have these illusions that they can form small communities and gradually they will spread and then you will have small communes everywhere. It's a kind of reformism from below. Counting on the bourgeoisie, not noticing. Now, there's a lot to be said for this idea because it, it, it cannot succeed, but even if, in theory, if we would say it would succeed, it's not socialism at all. It's going backward in history. small-scale, self-sufficient farming communities. But the time when the anarchists had the chance of taking power in the Spanish Revolution, in 1936, when, when the workers of Barcelona heroically rose up and defeated the fascists, And the nationalist government of Catalonia offered power to the anarchists. And told them, well, you have obviously taken power, now you should form a government. And the anarchist leaders said, no thanks, we're against all forms of government. and they let power remains in the hands of the bourgeois state. They let the bourgeois state be intact. 
Now, for different reasons, but in the end, because they both oppose the dictatorship of the proletariat. Reformism and, and anarchism actually ends up being the, the same in the, uh, in the end. Unless you, of course, break with those principles. Which a lot of anarchists did uh, in both uh, Russia and, and in Spain. In Spain with the great revolutionary Dorotti. who acted precisely according to the principles of Bolshevism rather than anarchism in the towns that his army liberated from Franco. Now Kautsky, he explained how he viewed the Soviets as, as merely organs of class struggle And he said that you shouldn't ask more of them than that. Lenin answered him and summed up Kautsky's attitude. And I think this goes well for the anarchist leaders in Spain as well. He said, thus, the oppressed class must strive towards decisive battles between capital and labor, but they must not touch the machine by which uh, capital suppresses labor. It must not break up that machine. It must not make use of its all-embracing organization for suppressing the exploiters. That is, workers fight, but don't you dare win. That is the end result. Because the anarchists, you know, they romanticize. It's okay, it's the same. It's okay with these local councils, these local Soviets, that's fine. Struggle, class struggle, sure. And they play the role of, of escalating the class struggle towards these decisive battles between capital and labor, only to take a step back and leave the workers to face a crushing, violent defeat. Again, because they're against the dictatorship of the proletariat. They're against the working class taking power. Now, we are not romantics. We do not envision a society born from capitalism as being a paradise from day one. It certainly wasn't in Russia. Workers' power didn't function perfectly. Wasn't without problems. Now, of course, they were very special circumstances. Civil war. Majority illiterate. But still, I would say we shouldn't say, oh, that was then. But now, you know, working class is very educated. Everything's going to be a dream from day one. Anyone expecting a revolution or the building of socialism to feel easy? should readjust their attitude. There is a scene in the movie Reds where the communist John Reed 
travels to Russia during the revolution and, and stays there after the revolution during the civil war. And in this scene, he's arguing with Emma Goldman, the anarchist. And she's complaining that the revolution didn't turn out the way she thought it would. And she says, I'm, I'm getting out. This is not how I want it to be. So I'm just going to leave. And John Reed here replies, he says, you seem to be a little confused by the revolution in action, Emma. Up to now, you have only dealt with it in theory. What did you think this was going to be? A re revolution by consensus, where we all sat down and agreed over a cup of coffee. The people, the poor, ignorant, superstitious, illiterate people are trying to run things by themselves. Just as you said they always should. But they don't know how to yet. Did you really expect everything to work straight away? Emma Goldman's attitude is, is not the attitude of a revolutionary. That's not the attitude we need. The real attitude that we need, the spirit of sacrifice, is the one that has been shown time and time again by workers and poor fighting, ready to give their lives, their everything for the sake of a future of humanity. Nor should we be afraid, but rather, or pessimistic, but rather have the same faith in the ability of the working class to rebuild on the piles of ruin that capitalism leaves behind it, as Dorutti said. He was uh, in an interview He, uh, in an interview, he was asked what they would do in Spain if they won. As they would be left with a society completely shattered. And he said, we, we have always lived in slums and holes in the wall. But you must not forget that we also know how to build. It is we, the workers, who built this, these uh, palaces and cities. Here in Spain and in America and everywhere. We, the workers, can build others in their place. And better ones. We are not in the least afraid of ruins. We are going to inherit, inherit the earth. The bourgeoisie might blast and ruin its own world before it leaves the stage of history. But we carry a new world here in our hearts. That world is growing now in, in, in this minute. And this is the case today. That world is growing now. All around the world, class fighters, communists are being born. 
and new embryos of the worker state will emerge through that struggle. And if we want to be the Lenins, and not the old Bolsheviks who didn't understand the, what the Soviets were, not the Kamenev and Zinoviev, who said, oh, no, no, it's not time. We need that faith in the working class. It's not built on, on uh, some sort of religious faith or utopia. It's built on this, what Druti said. We know what the working class can do. And we know that they can succeed. And we need to know that and we need to have the same spirit leading that struggle. And Trotsky explains this in, in the October Revolution or in the lessons of October. where he, he describes the attitude of, of Zinoviev and Kamenev and the others. He, he points on the one hand, to the fact that revolutionaries can, can be the most conservative during a revolution. because we're so used to being in a minority that we don't understand how fast consciousness changes during a revolution. And that we have a tendency to want to seek guarantees. Guarantees of success. But, but like um, the description that I gave in the beginning uh, of the reformists. In general, it won't be that easy. Referendum, yes or no to socialism, boom. But as Trotsky explains, it, it's only, I mean, you have to have a certain <laughs> feeling that it, it is the moment, the moment is right for an uprising. But there will be no guarantee. It's only when you push forward that, that you draw with you the whole advanced layer of the working class. And that they then draw with them the rest of the working class, the vacillating elements that you really test the, the strength between the classes. And too many times throughout history, revolutionaries have stepped back in that decisive moment. Only to say then, well, look at the consciousness of this whole layer. You know, they were not re revolutionary enough. So that is why we need that, that strong faith that we can succeed. We have to, as, as Rosa Luxemburg described the Bolsheviks, dare. That is the attitude of a communist. That is the attitude we need now that we're building this revolutionary communist party. A revolutionary communist international. That is how we win. Thank you.